They own today. My guest is someone that is familiar to you. He has been here before. We have a host of new issues that we are here to discuss. Uh, I'm going to entitle this show uh, Bed Bugs and Beyond. Okay, we're getting a little clever. And I'd like to welcome Ralph Citarella from Bound Exter Exterminating. Ralph, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, given the fact that we've discussed quite a few things in the past, um, there are some issues in town now that I'd like to bring up. And obviously, we'll talk about those and other things that you have uh, such a knowledge and skill for. If you notice here on my table, I have, um, it's not a real cat, OK? This, this is a fake cat, believe it or not. This is my representation of what a feral cat kind of looks like and how feral cats have been kind of terrorizing some of our neighborhoods. Now, Ralph does not handle, do you call it wildlife? Nuisance wildlife would be the term. Nuisance wildlife. But can you direct us as to where we would go, not only with cats? As of last night, I have a huge raccoon in my backyard. We have skunks, possums. So... We're not talking bugs yet, but what about the nuisance uh, wildlife? Well, a lot of the, the nuisance wildlife comes from a couple different places. Mm -hmm. um, to start off with the feral cats, you know, a lot of people don't even understand the difference between a feral cat and a stray cat. You know, a stray cat is still a domesticated cat that has good interaction with people, is, is friendly to people. You know, these are the cats that will visit a couple people in a neighborhood to get a couple different meals. You mm -hmm. know, you can pet them. They're nice. Feral cats are, are, are when these stray cats return to a more natural state, a, a primitive state, that pre-domesticated state. Mm -hmm. They have no interaction with humans. They're, they have no domestication. It's, it's almost like a, a, a bobcat to a lesser degree. Okay. So they are nasty. They bite. They scratch. They are, they are shy from humans. They're predators of uh, all sorts of rodents and, and songbirds and things like that. There's a, there's a large impact on the environment from from feral really? cats. Um, the Audubon Society puts the numbers of, of songbirds that are killed by feral cats in, in the millions every year. It's just, wow. I mean, it, it's absurd. But it's because when it comes down to it, you know, once these domesticated cats break out, they're not native to North America. Really? So they really just become an invasive form of wildlife mm -hmm. that is affecting the environment for their own ends. Mm -hmm. which, you know, if anything has shown us that introduced or invasive life, life, uh, life forms or, or species in general can have hugely detrimental impact to native environments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I believe that many people, you know, th there's an outreach going on in town now. I mean, I know that the uh, traditional thing to do is to trap them and then have them neutered and then set them back out into the same environment that they were in before. But in, in some neighborhoods, I've spoken to a lot of people, and they, it, it's become a health issue in many respects because they use the backyards as their litter boxes, literally, and um, not only scavenging through garbage pails. You know, one was so bold in my backyard that I was sitting out last summer eating shrimp, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a paw come up and swat the shrimp tail off the plate he scurried right over and he just went down and he started <laughs> chomping on the tail. My hus I looked at my husband. I said, did you just see what I saw? And he said, yes. He said, he's not leaving. So I had another piece of shrimp and I ate it and he just sat waiting, looking at me. So the part about them, they're not even afraid. You know, he, they, they were the, he was there for the shrimp. I couldn't blame him. I was there for the shrimp. <laughs> but <laughs> um, some of their behaviors are... are a little scary, even when you when it comes to small children being out in a yard or in a playground and encountering them. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just wanted to talk about it a little bit with you and hope that, you know, we'll be able to find some kind of a solution. I know there's lots of things happening in town where a lot of the natural habitats of these animals has be, have been unearthed. 
um, probably with possums and, I mean, skunks. Have you had any encounters with with those at all? Pretty regularly, as a matter really? of fact. We're, we're seeing the numbers of possums and skunks increase in town, a lot of raccoon activity as well. I mean, 10 or 15 years ago, you would have the occasional possum, the occasional raccoon, and, and almost never a skunk. Okay. Um, now, just think in the last couple of years, we've had the deer that were running around downtown Bayonne. Yes. The turkeys that are, are running around. I I've seen them myself the a bunch of times. Yep. It, it's a general, it's a re-empowerment of nature, and we're seeing it happen a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, thanks to EPA regulations and, and good hunting guidelines and minimal impact of industry on the mm -hmm. environment, we're getting a lot of these, these uh, animals to come back. You know, we're, we're seeing our, our hawks move back into town. Peregrine falcons have a nest down by the Bayonne Bridge. Really? Um, you know, these are all animals that 20 years ago just were not in the area because of environmental pollution or, or other things oh. like that. So the same thing happens. So not only do we get more hawks, we get more falcons, we get more bald eagles, which are moving into the area. It's, oh, that's great. Everyone forgets about the bottom end of that spectrum. So now our possums have that naturally rebounding kind of population growth. Mm -hmm. that, the raccoons are, are intelligent enough to carve an easy living in, in a city environment because it's they are so intelligent. They have problem-solving intelligence. Yes, I just honestly, I, I Googled it this morning because when we, we were sitting in our living room and my husband noticed something out the window and there was a giant raccoon climbing out of a tree and then he went all across our picket fence into the next yard followed by a feral cat. So it's a bit of a, of a circus atmosphere over there, and it's kind of interesting, but when I read about the raccoon, I said, they said that they can break, they can open up latches. They said they're, they have skills that I didn't know a raccoon would have. So I'm a little scared, but I don't know what to do about it. Besides, you, you do have someone that you say you call, though. Right, we, we have a specialist. Uh, the, the gentleman's name is Kyle Myrick. He works with his brother in uh, North Jersey Animal and Pest Control. Okay. And they specialize, even though the name is pest control, they specialize in animal removal. They, they focus on humane control and exclusion, trapping and relocation. So mm -hmm. it's good. You know, we do get a lot of calls for stuff. Mm -hmm. um, they specialize and we don't. So it's a stretch for us, but very easy for them. Okay. It, it's, it's a great relationship. We've been working with them for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And we turn over all of our stuff to them. You know, the, the guys are, not only are they good, they care about, about mm -hmm. running a good business and about the animals they're relocating. Mm -hmm. You know, because for every big raccoon you see sneaking through the backyard, there's a litter of four baby raccoons back home. Oh, please. And, not, you know, in my, not in my, hope, hopefully not in my garbage pails. Well, no, definitely not. I mean, they're going to be in a nest someplace, you know, someplace they're supposed to be. And, okay. and that's just a handful they're of cute. They're cute. You know? Don't yeah. get me wrong. I, I like the little masks. I like everything. I like the tail. I like everything about them. But just not only in, not in my backyard, okay? And we did find a massacred squirrel outside of our front yard. So my guess is, I was trying to figure out where the squirrel came from. Maybe a hawk. A hawk? Yeah, there's, there's red-tailed hawks in the area. They, they've come back with that big rebound. And they, they eat squirrels? Love them. They, they, they primarily feed on squirrels and rabbits in nature. So, I mean, could you, you, you can't go down to Bayonne Park without getting accosted by squirrels. So, of course, hawks have moved into the area to be predacious. There on you them. go. Okay. I would a little bunny, though. I mean, it's kind of cute, Ralph, in your Extremely backyard. Cute. As opposed to a raccoon. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> if someone has an issue and they need your help, tell us how they would get in touch with you. If they did have some kind of wildlife they want to help with, besides the bugs, we're going to get to the bugs. Okay. What, uh, what is your, you have an email that they can contact, a phone number? Oh, I, I don't remember. You can always contact the office and we'll be able to refer you out. Okay, so um, that's Bayonne Exterminating, and your address on Avenue C is? 1065 Avenue C. 1065 Avenue C. This is for new people in town who might come in and say, gee, what do I do? Who do I call? He's the only person to call, okay? Thank Talk you. about go Ghostbusters, Bugbusters, okay? So they would call your office. Do you know the not phone number? 201. 339-5119. Okay. So you would give Ralph a call. Ralph can help you with little little pests, big pests, pests, and we're going to segue into the fleas right now that are starting to become more seasonal kind of thing. Well, we, we've seen, in general, we've seen a huge rebound in flea populations. Um, okay. 10 or 15 years ago, after the really good flea and tick remedies, the back of neck kind of front lines and, and those things. Once everyone started using those, my flea business fell away. Really? Almost, almost to nothing. 
Um, and it started to rebound, and I'm not exactly sure why. There's some thoughts that it's because of the quality of chemicals being used, since a lot of those, a lot of those flea and tick remedies are no longer on patent. They're being produced by cheaper suppliers. Okay. You know, there's some questions about the chemistry being a, a, of the same quality as it was initially. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing fleas start to come back. So now you take the rebounding flea populations and the less effectiveness of, of on-pet flea and tick controls, mm -hmm. then you throw in your feral cats, your raccoons, your possums, and now all True. of a sudden, not only do you have flea populations increasing, you have their vector and transportation transmittal devices, all these small mammals. Okay. And, and, and again, you know, as the dog parks become more and more popular, you know, the combination of the dog walking park and everyone wants a green, clean, free space down at the park with no pesticide or chemicals applied. Absolutely true. So, you know, you have these several kind of, of, of circumstances coming together in this, in this one situation to produce and, and sustain ongoing flea populations. Mm hmm mm hmm So, so much of what we've worked at trying to prevent from happening has had a counter effect where we see the, you know, the environment, I know everyone wants the environment to be clean and everything to be, have no pesticides, but the pesticides did play a role in kind of keeping some, some of the pests, I guess, um, under control. Absolutely. I mean, it, the, the judicious use of, of pesticide, proper applications, doing the right timing, using the right product the right way, that's so important. Mm -hmm. and, and whenever someone thinks of, of bad effects from pesticides, it's never from the proper use. It's always from the misuse, abuse, overuse. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they take the anecdotal circumstance mm -hmm. and, and think that is the everyday. Mm -hmm. And that's not how it is. You know, it, you know, when you consider doing a flea application to a dog park, what you're really doing is tr getting rid of the fleas from coming home with homeowners, bringing these, these outdoor fleas into a house mm -hmm where children, are, children, elderly, and other people with compromised or lessened immune systems are there. Mm -hmm. And this is how children get tapeworm. Tape, By, oh, tapeworm. Flea, fleas transmit tapeworm. Really? It's one of the few ways for humans to get it is from a cat flea who's, who's affected by tapeworm. Okay. So now if your flea feeds on your raccoon or your possum, and then piggybacks home on your dog, mm -hmm. now all of a sudden you have a, a potential health hazard into your house, mm -hmm. but you're not really thinking that because you, you're concerned there's a greater exposure concern to that pesticide application that's made once a month mm -hmm. in a proper fashion. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not... Is it done here? Is it done in town? Um, at the dog park? As far as I know, no. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think things like that are done on an as-need basis as situations demand. Okay. One nice thing about a lot of the dog parks is they're kind of designed so there isn't a ton of, of viable flea habitat. Mm -hmm. Fleas are, are, are somewhat specialized in that throughout the course of their lives they need a couple different types of, of substrate or, or breeding ground or organic compounds to, to properly develop to in. Live. How long do they live, fleas? What's um, their lifespan? Very, very, uh, about three to four weeks, I'm sorry, three to five weeks as an immature form mm -hmm. and, and six, four to six months as an adult. Okay. Um, they're one of the longer lived insects as an adult form, but you know, uh, an immature flea needs a lot of organic debris, shade, moisture, things like that, and mm -hmm. dog parks are designed not to have those. So there's, okay. a, there's a good level of, of mechanical and, and uh, you know, kind of flea deterrence there's, there are thought, there's thought put into it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, we're not just putting fences up and, and hanging doggy bags at the one entrance and that's mm -hmm. that. You know, there's actual thought that goes into this stuff because there's, you know, one of the most important things about doing proper pesticide applications is making sure that you're not relying on that as a first tier response. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if you're doing proper sanitation, doing proper design, proper maintenance, things like that, mm -hmm. you know, constantly trimming that grass, that'll help out much more than a reactive pesticide application. So okay. it's the integration of those two methods that really gets the results. So in the winter time, what happens to them? Do, are, they, do they, are they dormant or are they, how, what happens to them in the winter? Um, all insects tend to overwinter in one way or another mm -hmm. where either uh, an egg will sustain itself through the winter. Really? or a gravid female, pregnant female, will find some warmer spot to go. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those two combinations of things are, are pretty good. And now, since fleas are so entrenched in the life cycle of mammals, it's easy for fleas and flea eggs to get set up with a squirrel who's going to make it through the winter anyway. So they don't have to worry about control oh, uh, or, or temperature control okay. because they're in the squirrel's nest, which never really falls below 
a habitable temperature for squirrels. So they piggyback off of another another a animal. Off one of their prey animals okay. or one of their, their parasitic uh, hosts. Okay. And so, and, and, and fleas also have a, a very unique aspect to their development where they're, they go through complete uh, metabolic growth, which means like a caterpillar, there's an egg, an immature stage, a pupil stage or a cocoon mm -hmm. before they come to that final adult stage. So mm -hmm. they change completely throughout the course of their lives. Mm -hmm. The pupil stage in a uh, butterfly, we would call it a cocoon, for a flea is almost impervious to chemical or, or other really? type of impervious, realistically impervious. You know, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like you can send it to space and back and it's still viable, but mm -hmm. you know, they can sit for months and months at a time and actually delay their development until a viable host comes in. Wow. Actually, we always, I always laugh in, in, in the entomology industry, we make a joke that the design for the alien in the original movie Aliens with the egg that opens mm -hmm. when the astronaut touches it, mm -hmm. that's very comparable to how flea pupae respond. Mm -hmm. They'll respond to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and vibrations of a larger animal moving around and then choose that time to hatch based on those stimulus. Interesting. So one thing you should know, and I would like Ralph to give a little bit of a commercial about how he knows everything that he does know, because this is not something, I know the business itself has been around for a very long time, your grand, I believe, was it your grandfather that started it on his porch? Grandfather, yeah. Yes, that I recall from the, the last show that we did. Your business is now in Bayonne for how many years? Over 90. Over 90 years in business. But my guess would be, Ralph, were you the only one that had an extended education in um, the field? Yeah, I, I did. I mean, you get a lot of hands-on education. We've always gone back to training. You know, um, the New Jersey State, uh, Pest Management Association has always held ongoing training mm -hmm. and we've always ex exposed ourselves to stuff like that. It's the best way to stay abreast of the industry. Um, after I graduated college in 2002 and, and came back home, I got involved in the industry. Um, I was getting my hands on stuff, I was getting my New Jersey Pest Management stuff, my mm -hmm. DEP training, and I kind of wanted to take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. So um, I took some additional courses at Rutgers, Purdue. Um, I did some postgraduate study. I got involved with the Entomological Society of America, mm -hmm. and uh, I became a board-certified entomologist in January of 2009. Wow. Um, and it was a, a two-year preparation for the board certification exam. It was, you know, I, I learned so much about not just pest insects. I mean, it really opened my mind because the, the pest insects we deal in an urban environment we're dealing with 12 different species of insects, that's it. Mm -hmm. Maybe 18 if you count all the different species of ants and flies. You know, so you're looking at such a small microcosm of the insect world. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when I really started to study entomology, I, I really fell in love with the, the breadth of the insect world and, and some of the beauty that you see and some of the intricacies that you see. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite things in entomology is mimicry how different species of insects will try and look like others. How many, really? how many species of flies try and look like a bee or a wasp so predators think they have a stinger. There's a bunch of different oh, moths. Oh, that's interesting, like little chameleons. Yeah, well not, they don't change so much, but they're designed to look like a specific thing. For instance, there's a species of moths that when they hold their wings in certain patterns, they look like owl's eyes. They have the face and the orange eyes for owls mm -hmm. so that anything that might prey on a moth would be afraid of an owl. So when this moth is naturally at rest, they look like two big owl's eyes sticking out of oh, a dark spot in a tree. That's very interesting. There's a ton of things like that. And I, I just, I mean, you know, it's so nice to see the other side of entomology yeah. instead of just, you know, Na the downside the what nature, we deal with. All about nature. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, people only want to only think about, well, let me just get rid of it. And obviously they want to kill them. But, you know, in, in, and they're not in a place where they're supposed to be either, but Ralph has a bit of a tender side when it comes to the job that he does. And um, the other thing that I wanted you to bring up a little bit were bed bugs, because I know that there's been a resurgence of bed bugs. And um, how do you treat those? Um, well, bed bugs are always a hot topic, you know, and, and anytime we talk about bed bugs, I always think it's important to, to mention that they don't spread disease. Okay. Which a lot of people think is, is something that's part and parcel to a bed bug infestation. And they're not only in a bed. No, no. They're um, not only in a bed. No, it's, it's the furniture next to the bed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's any of these items inside the mattress or box spring. Uh, they, 
they tend to travel very short distances to their host unless we push them that way. Mm -hmm. So if you have someone who's applying a, a cheap pesticide or even a heavy cleanser or alcohol spray to the mattress box bringer or furniture, mm -hmm. the insects will relocate into the cracks and crevices of the walls, if not into the wall voids themselves. Okay, so the host would be human? Yes. Okay, so they feed off of human. I'm getting itchy. Ralph, it's nothing personal. <laughs> Every time you come in, I start, to, time I start to feel the creepy <laughs> crawlers. I do. So the the hosts are human for bed yes. bugs. Yeah. The do, they, bugs, do they feed off of animals too? They'll, 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 they'll do cross-species hosting if denied a human host. Um, their favorites are actually chickens and, and other forms of birds. Okay. Um, and I have seen videos of bed bugs feeding on dogs. But I, I think a bed bug Bed bugs are, are one of those things that are in the insect world that are uniquely adapted to their host. They're kind of specific on humans. Mm -hmm. They have a very close relative called a bat bug that is almost morphologically identical to a bed bug, except they cannot survive on only human hosts. Once you take the bats out of the building, the bat bugs are on a limited time scale and eventually die. You're talking about bats? Yeah. Okay, do we have, because we just did a show with a baseball bat. Which is kind of, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of funny. But bats, we have bats in Bayonne. Yeah, okay. yeah, and not not as many as we used to. The the bats that are in New Jersey ha are just rebounding from a, a disease epidemic that moved through. Really, um, there was I believe it was called white nose fungus, a, a fungus that attacked the the respiratory passages of the bats. Mm -hmm. And bats can be extremely beneficial. You know they. Bats tend to eat large amounts of insects, both moths, mosquitoes, other flying insects, you know, and, and mosquitoes are w one of the few insects that we have that really are not beneficial. They're, they're, mosquitoes kill more people every year than all the wars what in the about world the, going what on. What are we talking about, the West Nile virus? What's the big virus now? Zika was, Zika. Uh, was everyone was scared of last year. Okay. Um, but there's other things. I mean, Malaria has shaped the course of human civilization, mm -hmm. and malaria still kills almost a million people every year in Africa alone. Okay. Um, the fact that Congress has a summer break is because of malarial mosquitoes in the 19th century. Really? Yeah. I mean, th this is this is how big an impact mosquitoes have on human health. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just this is not a new thing. This is just this year's thing. Okay. You know, fortunately, the mosquitoes that transmit the Zika virus are the same species that transmit yellow virus. Okay. Or uh, yellow fever. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a species of mosquito that we've kind of dealt with in the United States a mm -hmm. hundred years ago mm -hmm. when we started our first ditching and drainage programs or our general area wide mosquito uh, control measures, mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. like that. So we don't have a, a huge opportunity to, to suffer from mosquito borne diseases like a third world or undeveloped nation would. But, you know, when you see some of the images of, of the infected that, you know, people that have encephalitis. What happens to you them, know, yeah. I mean, when you think about diseases that mosquitoes transmit, we're talking about malaria, encephalitis, chikungunya, um, Zika. Also, I mean, these are horrible diseases. You know, most take lives, if not maim you forever. Have you ever been called on here in town to do anything with the Zika type Atmosphere? How? Where would we find them? In, in water sources, like outdoor? Where, where would they be? Um, the species that transmits the most diseases are, are the genus that transmits the most diseases are the Aedes genus. So that's our uh, Aedes aegypti, which is the yellow fever mosquito, and Aedes albopictus, which is the Asian tiger mosquito. Mm -hmm. they, like, they are small reservoir water breeders. So they're the guys that can get set up in a forgotten about potted plant, the bucket of water that you forgot to spill. Okay. They can breed in there in a very short amount of time. We're talking a week or two, depending on prevailing conditions. Really? Female mosquitoes lay hundred, uh, you know, hunt up to a hundred eggs every day. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a tremendous reproductive capacity. Um, so your suggestion to anyone watching the show would be, you know, if you're planning on going outside, check out any old flower pots you might have had laying around, buckets where water might have settled in, and just prevent that from happening, pooling water from happening, exactly. so that we wouldn't need to worry about um, a Zika kind of mosquito. Um, I know that here in town, I mean, as far as our population of, um, like, the natural habitat here, I mean, I've seen seagulls, you know, I mean, we're surrounded by water. Um, are, are we pretty level, though, as far as any type of infestations or are things pretty much under control? 
Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, we, we do see some different things happen because of a lot of development. Mm. Um, but we're in a pretty good we're in pretty good shape. I mean, you know, we're utilizing most of the land that we have available to us. Mm -hmm. There aren't huge dumpsters or landfills or, or things like that. You know, huge areas of, of discontinued use areas, you know, those can good be point. breeding vectors, you, you know. Um, you know, if you have a lake of stagnant water in, in, in a location, say down on the, on the old Motby, mm -hmm. you know, with mosquitoes flying two miles a day, that means that up to half the town can be affected if the winds are right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we kind of don't have that. So we're we're lucky. We're you know we're, we're so, maintaining. Okay. So on a plus side, you have a peninsula, obviously surrounded by water, but you do have development happening in all different areas, which has prevented problems from uh, being in our environment. So you know we seem to be a town that's we're moving ahead in ways that I don't think any of us could have ever imagined. I'm sure your grandfather probably would have never thought that here you'd have a third generation uh, person in the family coming forward. Do you have any, any of your children, are they interested in bugs? My kids are too young for that stuff. Too young? Yeah. Okay. All righty. So as it stands now for you, the most important thing I guess people need to know is if you sense that you have some type of a problem at home, you would give Ralph a call. Interesting thing is, I mean, Ralph does some stuff with me for real estate. He came to a, a listing that I had recently and went through the house and swept the, through the whole house looking for termites, which we didn't talk about, and came away and talked to the owner and said, you know, I know that there might have been a suspicion, but I didn't find any. And he's very honest and someone who, you know, would have, would someone who might have said, well, you know, if you need a treatment, I can do it for you. But Ralph isn't that person. You can rely on the fact that he knows what he's doing. And I'm sure that by watching the show, you realize he has a wealth of knowledge and he's pronounced some words that I wouldn't even know how to pronounce. But I want to say that um, we're thrilled that you came back again to visit us and we hope that you'll come back again. Thank you. My pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll have to 